We take you to Ukraine now and Joseph Lindsley. Uh, Joseph, I hope uh, we have another calm Monday. Where are you yeah, today? Bob, I'm talking to you back, uh, back in the city of Lviv in western Ukraine. And it is, it's a calm Monday. Uh, yesterday we had uh, uh, several air alarms throughout the country. Uh, but despite the, you know, except for the usual hot spots like that city of Bakhmut, uh, Nikopol, Mikolaev, uh, most of the country has been calm. Uh, and today, you know, you wake up on Monday, every Monday now, just kind of waiting for an alarm, waiting for to hear explosions. And today is calm uh, so far. Uh, here in Lviv, uh, just about, uh, I don't know, half an hour ago, I attended the memorial service of a foreign fighter, a Taiwanese fighter. Uh, same Sheng Guang, or he goes by, he went by Jonathan Sheng, and he came to Ukraine in June, uh, and he died uh, in, in Donbass uh, as Ukrainians were liberating uh, parts of uh, Donbass near Kharkiv region. Uh, and it uh, is an example here. So they had a, a memorial service for him at the, uh, the military church of St. Peter's and Paul, and then they had a procession uh, through the to, to the main square of Lviv, and it was very you know, difficult moment. Uh, it was many people standing in complete silence, some people kneeling, and the uh, all the city officials were there. In the main square of Lviv, there's a central tower, uh, sort of something out of a fairy tale. It's the tallest structure in Lviv, a, a tall white tower, and in the shadow of that, uh, there's two giant lions. Uh, that's Lviv gets its name from, lion, from the lion, uh, and sort of, you know, a, a very strong uh, symbol. And there, the city's trumpeter uh, and all the regalia, the red and gold regalia of the city played taps uh, mm -hmm. while everyone was in silence uh, in front of the uh, the funeral procession. And people were waving Ukrainian flags and also Taiw Taiw Taiwanese flags. And I'm not sure yet, but there was, a, there was a, a Taiwanese woman there in tears and Ukrainians were comforting her. And I, I, I can only assume that that was probably Jonathan's mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and here you see, you know, th there was especially moving to Ukrainians because the people of Taiwan also face an existential threat from from their you know from a neighboring nation a nation with which they many of them share a common language uh, with China and you know ta Taiwan was founded by people escaping the communist revolution uh, in, in in the 1950s and and you know the, especially since the 1990s Taiwan is a prospering free society and Ukrainians after their revolution of 2014 have stood with Ukrainian citizens have stood with the people of Hong Kong the, the Muslim Uyghur people uh, in in Western China and the people of Taiwan. Uh, so there are these strong bonds uh, of freedom between these people. And I think, you know, the, the analogy is clear. I mean, Moscow w wants to destroy Ukraine. You know, bo both Ukraine and Taiwan have amazing resources. They're, they're, they're both a key part of the semi global semiconductor supply chain. But the main reason, uh, you know, cause, uh, but the, uh, Russia and China are enormous countries. Uh, and, and, you know, they, it's not that they need more territory. The main reason why Russia and China uh, hate Ukraine and Taiwan is because they're free countries and, and, they, and, and they're scared of that because they, they don't want to have that type of freedom in their own nation. And, and so there is a strong bond. But it's also, uh, and as many commentators have pointed out uh, after the death of Jonathan here, Ukrainian officials were praising him. Uh, there are other Taiwanese uh, veterans fighting here. But it's a difficult thing for Ukraine because Ukraine can't anger China too much. Because, you know, China has been, you know, ha has not actively opposed Ukraine, even though they are allies of Russia. And so it's a very difficult uh, situation geopolitically. But you can see here some strong support, uh, uh, for, you know, the Ukrainian appreciation for, for this particular foreign fighter. Yeah, and President Biden is meeting with the Chinese leader uh, as we speak, and we'll hear more about Taiwan today. We saw a lot on the news over the weekend, uh, Joe, as you can imagine, about the uh, celebration in Kherson. But uh, then I'm uh, reading this morning that one Ukrainian official describing the situation there as a humanitarian catastrophe. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, as with, you know, when, when those Kiev suburbs were liberated early on in the war, uh, Bucha and Irpin, you know, and, and all this evidence was uncovered of what the Russians did during their time uh, in control of those regions. It's the same story with her son. And uh, it was, a, by all accounts, you know, during the past months of occupation, we could hear snippets of what was happening there. I mean, I have many friends who have family there and every maybe once every few months they could communicate with people. And and it was it was a hell. You know, and, and we had stories that, you know, after 3 p.m., Ukrainians could not go on the streets or they could be shot. Now, we're going to find out now during now that it's back in Ukrainian hands, we're going to get the details of exactly what happened during the occupation. Uh, it does seem that there were, especially in the government there, because that city fell so quickly that there were collaborators with the Russians. Perhaps they were bribed. 
Uh, and so all that is going to be uh, has to be investigated now. But but mainly it was scenes of jubilation. You, you didn't see celebrations around the rest of the country. I think people you know are staying calm and focused. Uh, but there is a great happiness for the people for Son. And then I saw this morning videos of what seems to be a Ukrainian amphibious landing. So where I spoke to you from Mikolaev uh, last week, uh, Ukrainian military uh, is moving down through uh, through the bay that leads to the Black Sea and onto this peninsula south of Kherson. And, and aggressively, it seems, moving to, to take back territory. So on the ground, things are looking really good for Ukraine. Uh, and uh, But we are going to find, and I know already the war crimes investigators are, are there in Kherson. And so, we, yeah, we're, we're going to, as always, unfortunately, uncover some horrible uh, stories of what happened during the Russian occupation. And finally, Joseph, how are your efforts going to deliver supplies to uh, people in need there? Uh, great. I mean, I haven't, there hasn't, we haven't done that in the past uh, five days since I left uh, Kharkiv region. But I wanted, there's a story I forgot to tell you all. When, when on one of the trips, uh, thanks to your listeners, we went to the village uh, uh, just two miles from Russia, a village that was occupied for seven months, and we gave people food and water. And a woman ran home and while there's artillery shelling going on, and she found us uh, as we were about to leave the village with a bag of apples and melons. And she was so grateful. And, you know, she needed water and grains, but she, even though she doesn't have much, she was so grateful she had to give us something. And this is really, you see this economy of generosity, you know, the people of Chicago helping, and then the woman who's so grateful that gave us a bag of apples from her garden, which is probably one of her most precious resources. And it, it was such a, just to see the gratitude and tears in her face. And, and, and so I wanted to make sure your listeners feel that because they, they contributed to that moment. Well, how, how rewarding uh, for you, for me, and for our listeners. Uh, thanks for giving us that feedback. Joseph, will speak tomorrow. I hope it stays calm there for the next 24 hours at least. Thank you, Bob. Keep hoping. <laughs> yeah.